Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, in this video I'm just going to demonstrate how a typical turn goes in Claws of the Tiger. So I've set up the map and I've played through one turn just to get a handle on the game and how it works. So the overall situation is thus. Um, you have starting British garrisons in Singapore and on a couple of the East Coast ports. It being five days relatively speaking, into the campaign, the Japanese have landed. On turn one, they've suffered a bit of a minor disaster at the Kutabaru landing site, in that the British forces on the coast were driven back, but insist inflicted such heavy losses that effectively the Japanese invading force there has been rendered combat ineffective. A second Japanese force has advanced south from the port of Patani, and more Japanese forces are massing, to try and force their way southwards. So it is turn two, and I've set up the main map as you can see. Now normally, each player will have a hidden force detail sheet with these boxes, holding boxes for each force, so that's the contents of Force F, um, divided between units which are at full strength. We've got artillery, anti-tank or tank and infantry and full strength weakened so you can tell that this unit here has already been in combat that is the holding box for um, British Force C in fact and similarly on the Japanese side um, you have an empty box for Force A which was the unit um, from Kotobaru that got itself thrashed. Um, second unit has been in action as well and suffered some losses. Again, this would be concealed from the British player. So what normally happens at the start of a turn is that both sides determine their supply state. At the moment, nobody is out of supply for the reason that although Japanese Force B and British Force C are in contact with enemy units, the Japanese can trace supply back up the road to the friendly port of Patani and further up to the Thai border. A British Force C, which is currently holding Kuala Krai, similarly has road access, unimpeded road access, leading all the way back down to Singapore. So they're in supply as well. So nobody's too worried about that to begin with. So the first phase uh, of a turn is the activations. Both sides roll to see how many activations they get to order. The next phase is movement and combat, and the final phase is reinforcements. And that, broadly speaking, is all there is to a turn. So what happens in the activations phase is first both sides roll to see how many activations they get. Now the Japanese get a base level of four activations a turn, the British get three. But an interesting twist on systems that I'm used to is that both sides roll two dice. They nominate one dice to be a positive value and the other to be a negative. This comes up with a modifier, which is then applied to their base level of activations. Now if that sounds like gobbledygook, let me run through. Um, so the Japanese have ba a base of four activations every turn. Their positive dice roll, this turn is four, and their negative is five. So cumulatively, they suffer a minus one. So they only have three activation tokens that they can make use of this turn. The British roll two dice. Their positive dice roll is five, and their negative is one. So they get plus four. Now, if I remember the rules correctly, there is a bit of a cap on how many activations they can have, uh, or at least activation bonuses. So I'm just going to check that very rapidly. Oh yes, it is limited to a plus one or a minus one. So the British get four activations, which actually, despite their poorer command and control arrangements, give them an advantage. Now, 
there isn't a huge amount of choice the British have as to deployments. The Japanese are able to use sea transport, and so the British have to leave these forces there to cover those ports on the east coast. If they do not do this, the Japanese can land forces there and cut the roads on which these units depend on for their supply. So much as the British player wants to, he cannot order these forces north. It's too great a risk, or at least it's too great a risk while he still has units up there. Similarly, there's not much to be gained by moving anything. Force C here is doing an amazing job of holding Kuala Krai and its precious airfield, which must be denied to the Japanese. They've got their backs to mountainous terrain here, so there's no communication between forces A and C. Force A is holding the town of Grick, slightly less vital, but they're a useful reserve. They're also watching the road which leads between the mountains to Butterworth, so if the Japanese Force B disengaged and decided to move this way, Force A is acting as a blocking force to prevent an easy Japanese advance on the strategic island of Penang. And Force B is doing a similar job because the Japanese have not committed those units to any sort of movement yet, and there is a very real risk that they will come thundering down. So Force B, Force A and Force C are in a sense tied this turn. They can't really afford to go anywhere. And it's a bit chancy taking the offensive against the Japanese at the moment, because although they've won a significant victory, the British have, at Kutabaru, the Japanese forces here are still formidable. So the British are going to voluntarily forego their activations this turn. The Japanese, for their part, are going to use all three of their activations. Now for their first one, they're going to activate Force B and have a crack at the defenders of Kuala Krai. So the first thing that happens, both sides roll dice to see how many of their forces actually engage. The Japanese roll three dice and choose the two highest. They roll a five, a six and a five. So taking the two highest, that's 11 units. So Japanese force B comprises four, five, six, seven units altogether. The Japanese player can commit all of them. That is the tactical chart, so that when your force is revealed to the enemy, that's what you show them of what's coming at them. The British roll two ones. Now this is terrible news for the British. Basically, the Japanese Force B has managed some sort of surprise attack. It's the only plausible explanation for this. And only two British units out of this beleaguered force can actually do anything to meet the attack. So they've pulled a bit of a blinder there. The British are hoping that they can stop them by using artillery as one of those forces. And one of the full strength infantry units as the other part of the blocking force. Now, as you can see, you get lots of counters. These are vital as loose change because as you reallocate strength points and move things around, you're going to need all these spares to keep track of what's, what's based where and who is doing what. So the British commit their pitiful, pitiful force to the defence. The Japanese decide they are not going to commit any air power this turn. The British, knowing that they'll lose what little support that the RAF can offer them after this turn, commit both their air strength points to the defence. So now we calculate the odds. The Japanese get two combat points for every full strength unit and one for each weakened unit. So, 
So it's 12 for the full strength, 13 when you count the weakened unit. There are combined arms force, so that's a plus two bonus for 15. They are attacking out of jungle into a town, so there's no particular bonus there. And lastly, the final bonus that they have to apply is one for combat cohesion, I believe. Oh yes, for their dice roll. Everyone adds a combat dice roll. So the Japanese total is 15, they roll 5. So that's a total of 20 points. The Japanese final combat value is 20 points. Now the British are in trouble. Their total is 4, effectively, for two full strength units. They don't have combined arms because they've not been able to include their anti-tank, but they do get a small bonus for it. Um, at least they've got artillery on side and two air support points. That gives them a total of seven. They are defending a town. And towns give you a further plus two if you're the defender, so that's nine. And having worked down the long list of other bonuses, their air points give them 11, and finally it's their dice roll, which comes to 4, 15. Not enough. The Japanese have scored 20, the British have 15. So the British have to retreat from Kuala Krai. They've taken too much damage. Um, the engaged troops evaporate completely. The remnants are not affected, but they are forced into a headlong retreat. And they have to retreat two spaces, so the attack is coming from this direction. So they essentially, thank God there's a bridge there, otherwise they would have been completely hemmed in and their formation would have come apart. As it is, they're able to flee down the road, but they have lost Kuala Krai, and the Japanese have the ability to march in. Now, the Japanese don't have it all their own way because the defender can inflict half the number of hits they received rounded down upon the attacker. So the Japanese have to lose two strength points from something. Two strength... Two um, hits reduces a full strength unit. So that four becomes three. And I'll put that weakened unit up to two. So two infantry battalions are now weakened in this Japanese force. But otherwise they have done very, very well indeed. And that, in a nutshell, is the combat system. Sorry, I'm being attacked by my cat. Um, the British, had they activated any forces, would have moved them. But as they're being passive this turn, all they can do is sit and wait. Of course, the strategic situation has changed now that the um, Japanese have broken through the defences at Kuala Krai. They've effectively unhinged that part of the Allied line and they may be able to exploit round following the road. So that and the fact that they've just deployed a gigantic scary cat. Claws of the tiger, indeed. Oh dear. <laughs> well, I'm glad I was able to get that part of the demonstration in, because as you can see, the gigantic cat has gone and ripped through the British defences, and has similarly done horrible things to the Japanese order of battle, not to mention messing up their reinforcements. Oh well. In a similar vein, the Japanese would have moved forces C and D to pursue various objectives, but I think those plans have been overtaken by events and by the giant cat. So I will leave that there. Um, the game continues through 16 turns, and if neither side has won by the time of the 16th turn, then 
you simply count objectives that are in the hands of the Japanese. If the Japanese take Singapore, it's an instant victory for them. If the Japanese seize all of the airfields around the peninsula by the end of the game, it is a win for them. If the British hold three airfields on the peninsula by the final turn, it is a British victory. Anything in between those victory conditions is considered a draw. So there we go. I'm sorry the um, <laughs> I'm so sorry the demonstration was interrupted, but I hope that gives you a bit of a flavour for how one turn of the game plays. The combat system is probably the most complex aspect of the game. The rest of it is really quite simple, and once you get your head round the combat rules, it should play quite quickly. So I'm going to wrap up this, this video here, but I will come back for a final sum up and uh, impressions of what I think of this game, what I like about it, what I might not like about it. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you at that one, hopefully. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. Sorry about the cat. Some of you probably preferred the cat to hearing me babble, but there we go. Thank you. Bye.